Hello, my wonderful, beautiful friends, guys. Welcome back to our slash entitled people, where people truly believe that they can do what they want, when they want, because they're special. And in today's episode, what is more entitled, guys, than people thinking they own your land? And OP teaches trespassers a lesson they won't forget. Guys, I hope you enjoy the stories. Don't shake your heads too hard. And as always, you can send or link your post to this email right here. Let's dive in. So this is a justice served story. Back when I was younger, maybe 10 years old, we lived in the backwoods of Texas. We lived next to a very grumpy old woman who I'll call Karen. She owned two very beautiful boxers, and she always let these big dogs out when I and my five-year-old brother were on the back porch. This meant my protective father would bring us inside because the dogs often got through our fence and he wasn't risking having us get hurt. About two years before we leave said house, we come home one day to her son tearing down a fence that was a foot onto our land because, quote, her yard isn't big enough for her dogs. She needs more space. Of course, we argued that what they're doing is illegal, like she can't just tear down our fence. That's when she said that we were harassing her by keeping her dogs out of our yard, where they like to play. So my dad, who was fuming about the whole thing, calls animal control, specifically a buddy of his who worked in it. They then went to the old lady's house and asked for her permit, because we were still technically in a county that forbade owning a boxer slash pit without permission. The woman didn't have any, so animal control immediately took the good boys away. It turns out that they were also starving and neglected all the time, and both dogs were very ill. My dad didn't want anything bad happening to the dogs, so he struck up a deal with the pound to let him pay for treatment and get a certification for us to own them. Within a month, those two dogs were back in our yard, and they were happy and healthy, with the biggest smiles. It turns out that once you feed a good dog, they stop growling and looking at you like a four-course meal. The funny thing is, the dogs refused to go anywhere near Karen's yard. They would even go full guard dog when she stepped on our land to try to take them back. So dad built a fence again, this time wrought iron with spikes on top. And when her idiot son once again was told to remove the fence, we called the cops, and he was promptly removed at dog point from our property. Eventually, we did give the dogs to a family member in a different state because we moved and we couldn't take them with us. But we did visit often. I wish I could find photos, but we had a house fire seven years ago, and it pretty much wiped out all of our old stuff. Honestly, guys, I did not expect that ending at all. Like, I'm just imagining the look on that woman's face when animal control just takes her dogs away, and a month later, they end up a part of OP's family. And guys, I'm so happy the two dogs had owners that actually cared for them. With that said, though, the entitlement, right? Like, let's just take down your fence so my dogs can run. Well, Karen, because of that, they're not your dogs anymore. And again, guys, she must have been so freaking mad that her dogs now live on the other side. Ain't that something? So this happened over two decades ago, when I was about eight or nine. And when this happened, we lived next to an elderly couple. They're always very sweet, and I really like them. During the holidays and summertime, they have their grandson Carl, and his mom come stay with them. Now this wouldn't be such a problem if their grandson wasn't such a mean brat. Every time Carl was at my neighbor's house, he would come over, and he would be really mean to me and my friends. The guy even tried to steal my bike because he liked the color orange, so he should have it. We also had a trampoline in our front yard, and we would sometimes let him come play on it, as that's the polite thing to do. Carl is about 10 years old, and he hates being told no. With that said, back then, I used to have one of my friends over all the time. Me and my friend were really ambitious, and we wanted to try to make a zip line on two of our backyard trees. We made makeshift harnesses with dog leashes, and we tied a rope from the top of one tree to the bottom of another. Now, it wasn't all that sturdy, but it worked as a cool summertime zipline. My mom told us that only me and my friend were allowed on the zipline, due to the fact that it could potentially be a safety hazard if it broke. The zipline was harmless fun, until Carl starts showing up. Our backyard is fenced in, to keep our dogs from running away, and Carl keeps yelling at us to open the gate to our fence, and to let him on the zipline. I tried to talk to him, but it went something like this. Carl screaming, open the gate, I want to play on your zipline now. I tell him, I'm sorry, I really can't let you on it, my mom told me it's just for me and my friend. He then says to me, your mom doesn't have to know, just let me come play. 
I tell him I don't think I can. And at this point, I'm ready to go get my mom, as I don't know what to do. He then proceeds to jump over our fence and into our backyard. That's when I run inside and tell my mom that Carl's getting on the zip line. Now, my mom knows how crazy Carl's mom is, and she doesn't want to let Carl on the zip line in case he gets hurt. Not to mention that he's trespassing. So my mom goes outside, and she starts to try to reason with Carl. At this point, Carl's climbed halfway up the tree. My mom tells him, I'm sorry Carl, but you're really not allowed on the zip line. You could get hurt, sweetie. Please come down. Carl tells my mom, I want to zip line. Again, my mom says, I'm sorry, you really need to get down before you get hurt. She then holds her hand out to try to help him down. And Carl just starts screaming and crying. It was insane. Now, thanks to the commotion, we can welcome Karen to the story. So hearing her child screaming, she rushes out, and Carl's still screaming through all this. Karen asks my mom, what are you doing to my child? My mom tells her, nothing, he climbed our fence and he's trying to get on the zip line. I'm worried he's gonna get hurt on it as it's not very sturdy. Of course, Karen didn't like this very much and she's fuming. She says to my mom, excuse me, you set up a zip line and you let your kid play on it in front of my son? Really? My son will not be excluded because your kids are too mean to let him play. Me and my friend are just kind of standing there in shock as Carl's halfway up the tree screaming his head off and Karen's standing outside our fence screaming at us. My mom tells Karen that she needs to get her kid and leave before she calls the cops. She yells obscenities before coming into our backyard and convincing her kid to get down. The entire time, she's just telling him, I'm so sorry these awful, horrible people won't let you play. They're so bad. I also heard her say, just come back later and you can play, sweetheart. So with that, they left, and I thought that was the end of it, but oh no, was I wrong. A few days later, my family decides to have a day out. We were going swimming and then out to eat. We get home around 7 o'clock at night, and Karen comes outside once she sees our car pulling up. And she's livid. She immediately gets in my parents' face about how unsafe the zipline was and how horrible we are for setting it up. She was screaming how Carl broke his arm and we were idiots for setting up the zipline. Apparently she allowed Carl to jump our fence and go on the zipline when we weren't home, and I was stunned honestly. She just kept going on how we have to pay his medical bills. My mom then explained that Carl was trespassing on our property and that Karen should have stopped him from getting on the zipline in the first place as we did give them a warning. She ignored it. She kept yelling at my mom for like 30 minutes before my mom threatened to call the cops on her again and she stormed off. I went to the backyard to check the zipline and sure enough, the rope that was connected to the trees had snapped and that was the end of our zipline fun. My mom wouldn't let us put it back up. We also didn't have to pay the medical bills as Karen had enough sense to know it was her fault her son's arm was broken. Every time after that, when they would visit, they would give us dirty glares, but they would stay away from our house. You know what, it sucks to say guys, but seems like things worked out in the end, right? Like Carl hopefully learned a lesson that day with that broken arm, Karen got to pay medical bills for letting her son trespass, and in the end, they both stopped bothering OP forever. I'd call that a win. So we've had issues with trespassers on our land, and I thought I would share on how I've dealt with them years prior. Here is some background. I live in a small town in the Midwest where people keep to themselves, and it's quite rare to have any spats with locals. The only instances of confrontation that come to mind are people not from my county or state. I should also note that there is a university not far from my land, so it's not uncommon to see non-locals and kids just exploring the wilderness. Generally, they keep to themselves and stay clear of the locals. That is, until two a-holes from the university came to visit. Now, I would describe myself as an outdoorsman. I love to fish, hunt, camp, hike, etc. So it follows that I do some of these activities on my land. I have a few ponds and forests which I conduct a lot of hunting on, mostly waterfowl and deer. I also have a permanent duck blind on one pond and a deer stand adjacent to my forest, both somewhat visible from the road. There is also heaps of farmland around my area, not much public land to recreate with. So naturally, as I've mentioned, people will go to many lengths to recreate on my land, either legally or illegally. This happened in late September, early October. I was out scouting for waterfowl on one of my ponds, and when I came up to the property, I noticed a Subaru SUV pulled off to the side of the road, onto my land. Now, if I had recognized the vehicle, it would have not raised alarm. I did not, and the outback had out-of-state plates. 
So I step out of my vehicle to investigate, and it was vacant. And then I smelled it. Smoke. Something was burning, and it was coming from my forest. So I grab a shovel and ran towards it. When I got to my forest, I could also hear some music playing. And there I saw two idiots. They had pitched a tent, and they had a campfire roaring. I was left speechless, like how could these guys have the gall to trespass? Anyways, I approached them and told them to turn off their music, and they look at me in disbelief. There was silence, and then the a-hole spoke. A-hole number one said, Hey man, you're really killing our vibe. A-hole two says, Dude, get lost. What are you doing here? That's when I say, You guys need to get out of here right now. The guy says, Why? I tell him, This is private land. I'm the owner, and you need permission from me to be here. A-hole number two says, well, can we have permission to be here? I tell him, no, and he asked, why? I say to him, because it's my land, and I don't want you here, I don't need to explain myself. Now, this must have gotten through their minds, as they just packed up, and I escort them off my land. But before they leave, A-hole number one remarks, just so you know, we'll be back, you can't always be here to catch us, you know? I just laughed, I told them good day, and then assessed the damage they had done. The two had cut down several trees for firewood, and why they didn't use dead ones, I have no idea. I also found empty beer cans and a few smoked joints on a tree stump. When they pulled out of there, one had mentioned something about the land having nice off-roading trails, which did spark an idea in my brain. I knew what area he was referring to, my buds and I have off-roaded there before. So with that, I prepare the area for the two, should they come back. I wanted to plant native prairie grass where we off-roaded, so I staked about 200 meters of barbed wire where I intended to plant the grass at a later time. I pretty much left it at that, and the next few weeks were uneventful. It was late October, and I was in my duck blind one afternoon with some friends. We then hear loud music coming from an oncoming car, and it was the a-holes. I watched as they drove through my land and headed for the off-roading area. I informed my buddies of my prairie grass project, and we all began laughing when they entered the barbed wire area. A minute or so passed, and we couldn't hear their engine running. So we left the blind to investigate, and what we came up on was a thing of beauty. Most, if not all, the barbed wire was gone, mangled in the Subaru's axles. When we came up on them, A-hole number one's freaking out, and A-hole two is assessing the damage. A-hole one starts yelling at me, saying he's gonna sue me for damaging his vehicle. At that, I laughed, and I told him he shouldn't be here to begin with and to get off my land before I call law enforcement. So I did. Two, to be exact. I call our local conservation officer and the sheriff. I told the sheriff that I have trespassers that refuse to leave. I told the conservation officer that I had non-hunters, harassing hunters, and wild game. And he told me he would be there within the hour. Ten minutes pass, and the sheriff shows up. I let the a-holes explain themselves, and they said I had given them permission to be on my land. And on purpose, I destroyed their car. The sheriff then looks at them, and then asked me, do they have permission? I said, no, and I suspect they're under the influence of something, as no logical person would drive through barbed wire. The sheriff asked why I thought that, and I said, last time they trespassed, they left a ton of empty beer cans and weed. The sheriff's eyes gleamed, and he told the two a-holes to empty their pockets and that he would search the car. And what happened next was hilarious. There was nothing in the car, and a-hole had nothing in his pockets, but that's when a-hole 2 starts crying. The guy had pot on him. So in addition to trespassing, a-hole 2 was cited for possessing illegal drugs. The sheriff then told the two they had to figure out how to get their vehicle off my land. He then offered to give them both a ride back to the university so they could sort it out. And that's when the conservation officer arrives, at the perfect time. I told him that they had trespassed and in doing so, they harassed hunters. Now, hunter harassment laws are open to interpretation in my state. But given the situation, the two were issued three tickets for harassing hunters. That's a misdemeanor and over $5,000 in fines. I also mentioned that they cut down trees on my land. A-hole says, that wasn't me, that was A-hole number one. So now, A-hole one's charged with destroying property. Honestly, we tried so hard to keep it professional and not laugh our asses off, as the sheriff takes them away. I didn't hear from the two for a few days, and then I got a letter in the mail. It was from A-hole one. He was asking for written permission to retrieve his vehicle from my land. He gave me his number to contact him so we could sort it out, and the call went something like this. I call him and say, so I read you want permission to retrieve your vehicle from my land. He tells me yes, and I tell him permission denied. 
you can have someone on your behalf retrieve it for you. I do not give you permission to be on my land. There is a towing service you can call. You are not to set foot on my land. The guy basically tells me, F you, man. The next day, I get a call from the towing service asking if they can go get the Subaru. I say yes, but that a-hole number one can't set foot on my land. The guy agrees, and I take him to where the mangled Subaru is. It took about two hours for him to pull the Subaru out from its barbed wire bed. This made a-hole one quite mad. He kept calling and telling the tow truck driver to hurry up, which pissed him off. When he got the Subaru onto the road, a-hole one starts cussing him out, and the driver tells him, you know what, I won't tow you back. He then detaches the Subaru and left it on the road and drove off. At this point, I'm just laughing like a madman. His car did turn on, but it wouldn't budge. He was getting really flustered and had a meltdown. The guy called a-hole 2 to pick him up. I stayed there to make sure they didn't do anything else. They left the Subaru on the side of the road. When they were gone, I called law enforcement one last time, and I said somebody was illegally parked on a road. I gave them the location, and an hour later, they were towing the Subaru away. I never heard from those a-holes again. Do not F with a man's land. So guys, the lesson of the story here is do not trespass, and definitely don't be an a-hole when you're caught trespassing, and then do it again. Like, those two could have avoided so much trouble by just being polite and respecting private property, right? But some people live in their own world. Oh, he says we can't be on his land? Well, let's just go anyway. And this is what they get. Hopefully, those two did learn a lesson that day. So I've got one gem of a story that my grandfather told me about his hometown after he came home from World War II. It has to do with a tree farmer, a corrupt mayor, and over 20 homes getting bulldozed. So at the end of World War II, thousands of troops were heading home. They were starting new families and wanted to move out of the city. There was a major housing boom all around the county, and people couldn't move out of the cities fast enough. Developers could also not build homes fast enough. There was also a ton of money to be made in the construction business, which led to some underhanded building practices. One such practice was starting construction before the land acquisition was finalized. Enter my grandfather, who we'll call George. So after serving as a pilot during the war, he came home to a very different town. When my grandpa went off to fight in 1942, the town that he described leaving was tired and worn down. But to his amazement, the town he saw stepping off the train in 1948 was anything but. There were newly paved roads, a traffic light, and new homes. New homes that just went on and on. He actually got lost on his way back to the family farm. But what took him by surprise the most was the new development being built on his childhood friend John's tree farm. This was surprising to him, mainly because he knew how much the farm meant to John and his family. The farm went back at least two generations, but my grandpa just guessed that the developer made John's family an offer too good to refuse. However, that thought was shot down later that evening, during his welcome home dinner. It was my great-grandmother who tipped him off, that something was off. He couldn't recall exactly what she said, but it was something along the lines of, Oh, I just wish John was still alive to be here. My grandpa nearly choked, not because of the news, but because John wasn't dead. He was still in Hawaii. My grandpa had gotten a postcard from him not but four days before. It turns out, while John was off in the Navy fighting in the Pacific Theater, John's dad had suffered a stroke and passed away, and his mother passed away less than a week later from a broken heart. More than likely, John was never informed of their passing. And now, 20-plus homes were being built on their land. My grandpa ran out of the house. He jumped in his father's Model T, raced down into the town to send one bombshell of a telegraph to John in Hawaii. He said, John, your folks passed. Farm is now being built on. Come quick. My grandpa never got a response back. He figures that John must have fainted from shock, then jumped up, ran to the Navy base to get on the first boat home because he was back home in less than four days, and he was mad. According to my grandpa, when he burst through the doors of the mayor's office, everyone in the room looked like they were about to drop dead. The poor desk clerk was fumbling over his words, trying to talk to John. And then the mayor came out of his office to see what the commotion was about. As soon as he saw John, he went white as a sheet. Getting nowhere at the mayor's office, John went to the next town over and he hired a lawyer. What followed was a seven-year court case that ends in the mayor being sentenced to eight years in jail and the developer going bankrupt. It turns out that after John's parents passed away, John wasn't able to be contacted for some reason and he was presumed dead. 
So when an out-of-state developer wanted to build homes in the area, the mayor just permitted them to start building on John's farm, for a hefty kickback, of course. Also, because of John's lawsuit, the developer couldn't finish the pre-sold homes, which ended up in more lawsuits. In the end, the mayor and the developer and the town ended up having to pay John close to $45,000 total, which is over $752,000 today. And then, the farm had to be returned to its prior condition. To say John was happy would be a vast understatement. Today, John's tree farm is a nature reserve, and the story of the corrupt mayor is all but forgotten, except for by a few locals. John passed away in 1999. My grandpa's been back to his hometown a few times to visit his grave and to check up on the old tree farm. Now this was an awesome story guys, and you really have to wonder, like how many other people fighting for their country had their property pulled out from under them, right? Like, I can guarantee John was not the only one. And guys, I would have loved to have seen the look on the developer's face when the guy was forced to bulldoze all those houses and was forced to return John's property to its prior condition at his expense. What a wild story, guys. And that, my friends, brings us to another end of our slash entitled people. Guys, I hope you enjoyed today's stories. If you did, hit that thumbs up. And if you're not subscribed, consider subscribing so you don't miss these crazy stories. And guys, if you missed the last episode on the channel, it's an r slash entitled people episode where a Karen teacher won't stop spanking OP's brother and she gets taught a lesson she won't forget. Guys, go check it out if you haven't. And myself and Stevie Boy will see you guys in the next one. We love you.